Amen, amen. Y'all doing good today? Yeah. Well, hey, last week, um, I truly believe, um, and this is going to sound weird after 20 years of my life, but I believe that last week, God intentionally, on purpose, being a God of detail, um, kept me out of church. And that sounds really weird, but I woke up ready to come to church, and my wife come in from getting a shower and said, I think I need to go to urgent care. Something's not right. And uh, she ended up having a, a bacterial infection. And so, but anyway, it, it delayed um, me even being able to be at church because once we went down there, um, I ended up taking her there, them figuring that out, taking her back home, being at the, at the drugstore by 11, getting her medicine, um, going to the Dollar General to get her water and you know, being home, but it was the weirdest thing for me not to be in a church on Sunday morning. Um, for 20 years of my life since I've become a Christian, um, if, if, I am, if I am not in church, there's only two reasons. Either I'm really sick or I'm on, well, how y'all doing, newlyweds? Amen. <laughs> so what you get for walking into church late. <laughs> I could, I could take that so much farther, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm just going to let that ride right there. But it was really weird for me as, as, as a man of God, as a pastor, not to be in church. Um, from the very first minute where I accepted the Lord, I went to church. Um, before I ever become a minister or led worship in a church or become an associate pastor or started, started a church, merged with this church, going to church when I become a Christian was just something that was just routine and it's something that I did and I took very serious and I felt that it was a priority in my family. So I don't really know what it's like out there on a Sunday morning um, when I'm in here every week. I don't know what it's like and what it looks like out in the public um, to not be at church on Sunday morning. And I believe that what had happened is I got so inspired by not being here last week, by the message that you're hearing today, that um, I was sharing it with Eric, um, you know, our drummer up here. He, was, he comes to my house frequently now, um, a lot, so I'm not really an empty nester. Um, <laughs> But he spends a lot of time at my house. You know, he does walks and he lives very close. And it just seems like every other night he's there for three or four hours and we talk about God. We talk about um, our, our life and, and what God's doing in our life. And we talk about the church and we talk about football because I love football. And, um, but I was telling him that God had inspired me. And I told him, I said, this is what I'm going to preach next week. And I told him this last Sunday. And he, and he says, you really might want to watch uh, Josh's sermon when it comes out. You really might want to watch that because um, what you're going to be talking about is going to be overlapping what he just did today. So the next day I went and I watched his, his message and I was thinking, that's exactly what I'm going to be preaching today. Almost exactly. And But I heard of a preacher one time, he, stood, you know, he got hired to this church and, and they asked him to come in and he come in and he did a message. And uh, they said, after the, after the service, he said, that was a really awesome message that you did. And he said, oh, I really appreciate it. And he come back in the very next Sunday, and he preached the exact same message. And the people just kind of looked at him a little bit weird and said, that was, that was a good message there, Pastor. And he come back in the next week, and he preached the exact same message again. And so finally, somebody from the leadership come up and said, Pastor, we love that message you preached because for three times it's been pretty powerful, but we're wondering when you're going to preach something different. And he says, well, I'm going to preach something different when you get the message. That's when I'm going to preach something different. So I believe that God has called, not only put something to my heart last week when I was out there, um, you know, in driving around and seeing what's going on on a Sunday morning, when Pastor Josh is standing here at the exact same moment preaching a sermon about going. He was preaching a sermon about how the church is not just supposed to be this just this final destination. And I'm out there and I'm saying, wow, this is, this is, a, this is really weird to see what's going on on a Sunday morning. And I was shocked, y'all. I was shocked to, to, to know that, you know, that there would be so many people out. That it looked like a Saturday afternoon. 
I was shocked that, that what I would see at, at, at noon or maybe one o'clock after we had done lock this building up and I would go out and I would see all the people that would be out after church, that never ever would have shocked me. Because people I would always think in my head, my, I would just program to think that everybody went to church, that after church there would be a lot of people out at restaurants. I never even my, in my mind fathomed that I would be sitting down at urgent care at nine o'clock in the morning and 15 people would roll in there. All the businesses are opening like normal. Traffic is just crazy. Yeah. You know, and I left there and I went to the Dollar General to pick up some water before taking Linda home and it was packed. And then I got done with that and I got her home and I got her in bed and at 11 o'clock I'm sitting down at the drugstore and all of a sudden I'm looking around and God's saying, are you seeing what I want you to see today? Because that's why you're here and that's why you're doing what you're doing today. It's not that, that you know, my wife could have had a bacterial infection at any point. My wife could have been dizzy at any point. And, and God says, no, 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 I got a purpose because Pastor Josh is doing something that he needs to be telling the church, but I need you to be doing something so you can see why he's preaching what he's preaching. Amen. And it's going to align together today. And, and, I, and I say, God, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why aren't these people in church? Why aren't these people connected, you know, to a body of believers somewhere in this county? I mean, it was almost sad to me and it almost hurt my heart because it was, I wasn't supposed to be where I was at, but this was just something normal. And they're there a lot. I always wondered why God said, there, let, let there be a day of rest. And last Sunday, God said, that's why I said that. That's why that I said there'd be a day of rest so people would actually consider the fact of not running business when every single location, if you drive around this county right now, will be open right now. And I know that people have to work, and there's nothing that I can do about that. That's just the way our culture is, is everybody wants everything right now, and, and they want to be able to have every store open 24-7. I get all that, and that's just where our culture is. But it's just sad to me that even though all those people are working, the streets are aligned with people running around, going to these stores, going and doing this, going and doing that, as if church on Sunday morning... I mean, I'm going to tell you, if you're a Christian, can I tell you that church on Sunday morning is the very first thing you usually do? You might miss Sunday nights. You might miss, like, Wednesday nights if that church has it, right? But Sunday morning is something that is just ingrained that if you're a Christian, you're going to be in church on Sunday morning. And so I, I put this first point up here to say this, is that for the Christian in a relationship with God, for the Christian in a relationship with God, church is not an option. Church is not really an option, really, for us. Like, we understand that we're not serving like the church. We understand that we're, we're serving God, as Pastor Josh was preaching last week. But church is just something that you do because it makes you better. It makes you a better Christian. It fuels you up for what you have to contend with all week long. But it's something that it's not even an option. And, and, and I know I've... I've talk to people before and says, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. And I get that argument. I really do. Because what they're saying is they're saying God is bigger than the church. And I will fully agree with that. But I think that we forget some of the things that the Bible says. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It was one of my first verses that I ever memorized. And here's what it says. It says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Did y'all catch that? Not give up meeting together. And then it don't even just say that. It says, as some are in the habit of doing. Like, it's already making preparation for where this thing called Christianity is going. It's saying, don't, don't, don't neglect meeting together because there's going to be some people that's going to be in the habit of doing that. But I don't want you to do that, it says. And it says, listen, but, but, you know, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day approaching. Like, like, uh, like meeting together all the more as you see things going awry. Meeting together all the more as you see things falling apart in your family. Meeting together all the more as you see the day coming where God's going to eventually just open the skies and just come back. All the more, not all the less. All the more. 
And in Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish uh, one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, uh, songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. See, it, when you start thinking about this, this is what I would call a definition of what church would be. You know, we're singing and we're teaching and, and we're, you know, the songs from the Spirit, we're singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. That's what the church really looks like. And that's really kind of what the Bible is telling us is that don't neglect it. Do it all the more. But while you're doing it, remember who you're doing it for. Exactly what Pastor Josh preached last week. And Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves. And, and, and I know because you're here today, there's a certain level of the devotion that you have, but the one thing that we, we cannot ever forget is that while we're here, you know, and devoting ourselves, while we're here doing what I'm preaching, we're not neglecting meeting together. That's what we're doing here today. What we're doing, and we're following what the Bible says, we're singing the songs, we're lifting up to God, we're doing every single bit of that. But it should shock us to know that in this very county that we live in, and I know not everybody lives in this county, but I'm really only pertaining to talking about this county today because that's where our church is. That's where our greatest impact should be, would be within the county that we're planted in, that we're here, right? So it should shock us that at 1030 to, till noon, there is a lot of people that aren't doing this. And can I tell you, it's not their responsibility. It is to some extent, but it's the church's responsibility to go get them. To go get them. Here's a second point I've got for you. Just like you do, people around you need Christ too. Just, just like you do, people around you need Christ they need Christ. We need to be in conversations with people all the time, whether they are a Christian or whether they are not a Christian. We need to be in conversation, you know, stirring up conversation, telling people, hey, well, you know, you need to come check out my church. You need to come, in, and not because we want to fill the place up with numbers, but, but, but because we want to see God do something in their life and in their family. We want to see them come to know the same Jesus that we know in here today. And if you're here today and you don't know him, it, it's kind of rare for you to even be here when you look at what's going on outside. Mark 16, 15 and 16 says, and he said to them, go, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Do you know you could live your entire life off that one verse? Like, like if, you're, if, you're, if your message of your life said, my message is going to be to go, and my message is going to be to proclaim, that means that you can't just go. You can't just go and be an attender of what's going on. No, no, no. The, the Bible says, we want you, you know, I want you to go, but I want you to proclaim the gospel to the whole Maybe I turned it off. I don't know. <laughs> but God hit me when he says, do you really believe what this verse says? That I'm asking you, I'm telling you what you need to do. You need to go. You need to proclaim. Because the people that come to know me that are baptized, they're going to be the ones that's going to be saved. And, 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 and if you're not telling them, how can they be? There's a place in the Bible, and it's not even in my, in my sermon today, but it says, how will they hear if we don't tell them? How will they come to know Christ if we don't go do and tell them, if we don't proclaim? Matthew 9, 37, 38, and I know I got a lot of verses, but this is what the Lord really gave me seven days ago. At this exact time, as, as he was building the message in my heart, as you all were, if you were here last week, raise your hand. <laughs> See, y'all heard the message that was preached last week. 
All this is, is I was sharing this all with, with Eric, and he's like, you really need to listen to that message. You really need to listen to it. Matthew 9, 37 to 38 says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And, and there's so many times, I think I've read this wrong my entire life. And when I, when, I, when I put this into this message, God was saying, I want you to understand something. This message is really not praying for people to work inside the church. That's not what this message, I used to always pray, be like, God, send the laborers. We need help in this church. And God really convicted me this week and said, you know, you realize that you've read this scripture wrong, like for 20 years. Like you prayed this scripture wrong for 20 years. He said, because I don't want you to pray for laborers to come in and just work inside the church. Because inside the church is easy work. That's the easy work. He was saying, I want you to pray earnestly that the Lord, listen to the Lord, that you'll send them out into his harvest. Do you know where his harvest is at? It's outside these doors. That's where his harvest is at. Every lost soul is a part of his harvest, and he wants us to go pick them, to go pluck them up, to bring them in, to hear the message. We'll preach to them if you'll help get them here. That should be a message, and that should be a thing that we all do every single day, every single week. There should be a not a week go by that we're not inviting at least three to five people to church this Sunday coming up. Every single week we should be investing that. Why? Because it's important. We have all the capabilities of social media, Instagram, Twitter, and all these other things. We have a phone that you can still pick up and dial someone's number. You can go visit. I know we don't do that anymore, but you can go visit. You can walk next door. You can say, hey, I, I just want to let you know what God's doing in my life. I love you to death, and, and, and I just want to let you know, if, if you're not in church, um, you know, hey, man, we would love to have you at our church this Sunday. That's not being condemning. That's, that's not trying to run them down for their lifestyle. Love on people. Go out and get them. Do you know this? I, I, I was shocked when I read this this week. And I guess because my mind works different as a pastor. My mind works so different. I'm always looking for the opportunity to walk someone to Christ. That, that is like the joy of my heart, man. I'm like, man, if I get that opportunity, that's going to be amazing. Like, that's what I'm looking for. I want to talk to people. Do you know Christ? I don't know him. Oh, man, i got to share this guy with you. I love him so much. He is great. God is good. And you need to hear it. Just for the opportunity to lead them to Christ. But I, I read this statistic, and I truly believe it's probably true. It says, only one in ten believers have ever led someone else to a saving faith in Christ in their entire life. Which means that 90% of Christians keep their faith to themselves, which is never what God intended. What that's saying is that one out of ten people in here, one out of ten people in here, if we were to go around the room and line everybody up and ask, start asking the question, have you ever led someone, just you, I ain't talking about going, taking them to the pastor, I'm talking about just you. Have you ever led someone to Christ where you've walked them through the sinner's prayer, where you've said, hey, uh, you know, this is what you need to know to know my Jesus that I serve. One out of 10 people in the church today, which is 90% not doing it, has led someone to Christ in their entire life. Folks, can I tell you, that's, that saddens my heart to believe that. But by, based on what I seen last week in our own county, it was more evident than I've ever believed it would be. 1 Corinthians 9.22, Paul said this, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. And Paul makes this so personal. Paul understands that it's not really him that's going to save him. But do you read that last line that's on there? I might save some. What he was realizing that if I don't do it, no one's going to. There's a selection of people in your life. There is a selection of people in your life that God has called you to, that you would be the one 
that I might save them. Small group of people, each person is assigned that if we don't reach them, no one will. Last week, I, I love the, the, the illustration because I typically always go back and watch a sermon. I either watch Pastor Josh's sermon when I'm not preaching on Monday morning at work. I'll be sitting there just programming my machine and I listen to his sermon. Or I'll listen to mine because I have a tendency of saying words over and over and the, the guys let me know about it all the time what those words are. So I'll listen to the sermon just to see how many times I say a certain word. Like my word used to be basic. Or, you know, what was the other one, Josh? You remember the other one? I, I used to say things like, you know, listen to this and, 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 and listen, listen, listen. And now I'm going to start doing it because I said it. But I would go and I would listen because I want... I would go and I would play it. I would play it because I wanted to know the words that I repetitively said over and over because I want to be a better speaker. I want to, I want to improve in that. So it's good for me to go and listen over and over. That, I'm using it in the right text this time, y'all. But I want to improve. And when I heard him tell this illustration about the airport, about being the final destination, that people look at the airport, and, and could you imagine flying into a city and just, just staying at the airport and then just flying back home and, well, you know, I've been to New York or I've been to Chicago. And he said, that's what the church has kind of become. And that blew me away. Blew me away when, when, when I heard that illustration because God was so telling me that last week, saying, people are just thinking that coming to church is the thing that's winning our county. And it's really not. It said that his workers have to go out and do something to tell people and to proclaim the gospel. Luke 19.10 says this, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Can I tell you our mission is to go? Our mission is to go. If the Son of Man came to seek and to save... And then he sent his disciples out to seek and to save. Then we can go ahead and assume because he did it, his disciples did it, the church did it, Paul did it, every, every writer of the, of the Bible did it. Our mission as a church is to go. That's our mission. We are supposed to be a church on the go. That's just, it just did. And God let me know this this last week. As I was driving home from the pharmacy, God said this, God said, you realize that you're plan A, right? <laughs> you're plan A. Like you are, you in the church, I want you to tell these people that they are plan A. There is no plan B. God doesn't have an alternative plan to get people saved outside. He, he constituted the church to bring the believers together so that they would be equipped and build up and listen to sermons and be encouraged. We come in together. It's like a gas station. We come in, we fill up, and we go out, and we go, and we go, and we go, and we proclaim. Why? So that we might save some. That's what we do. We are plan A. There is no plan B. No plan B. We need to be a church that's on the go. Our church needs to be on the go. And if you, if you didn't catch it last week, I pray that you're catching it this week. God showed me one more set of scriptures that has nothing to do with really other than just a point. But I want to read something to you that God showed me this week out of the Bible, and he says, I want to show you the cost, the cost of not going. I want to show you the cost of not going. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting at verse 1, it says, In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. I just want to stop right there just for one second. Don't go to the next one. Go back. There you go. You're there. In the spring of the time when kings go out to war, at this time, do you know what David was? 
king. Let's all say that. Just grab this in your head. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war. What was David? Say it. King. king. Why wasn't he going? Why wasn't he going? God showed me this this week. He said, let me show you the cost of not going out, Earl. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king, the king's men, and the whole Israelite army. David should have been with them. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbi. But David remained in Jerusalem. Let's keep going. One evening, the very next verse, y'all, the very next verse, God said, get this. One evening, one evening, while his men are out to war, while David's not out to war, and all the rest of the kings... One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. God said, you know what? If David would have been going like he should have been going, he never would have saw Bathsheba. Get that in your head today. If you don't know the story... David goes out and he sees this woman bathing. This woman's a married woman. He is the king. And he calls for her, has her come over. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, has her husband come back in from the war that he's supposed to be in. When, when, when this guy that comes back in, he, he says, David says, I just want you to go spend some time with your wife. Well, I'm sure you do, David. Sure you do. You want him to go sleep with her. Why? So it would look like that he got her pregnant, not David. See the trouble he's getting in? This guy says, no, I ain't going to do that. He goes out and sleeps at the gate. So you know what David? David realizes that this plan didn't work. So I'm going to go to plan B, and I'm going to go ahead and send word out when he goes back out, and I'm going to have him killed. David had Bathsheba's husband killed out in the field where he was supposed to be out there fighting. I just, want, I just want you all to grasp that's what I'm saying today. God said, let me show you the cost of not going. One evening, when David was supposed to be going, he was at home, not doing what he's supposed to be doing, and got caught up in a mess. And God says, Earl, you know why that's so important for the church? He says, because when the church isn't going, they get caught up in the sin and the mess. They get derailed. They start arguing over carpet and paint colors. They start arguing over design. When the church isn't going and it's so inwardly focused and we're not out there proclaiming the gospel, what happens is we fall prey just like David did. We're just sitting at home. And God says, do you know how you put yourself in a position to be attacked when you're not doing the word of God, when you're not on the go? I'm going to have the band come on back up here. And about five years ago, I did this illustration. Where, hey, just so everybody knows, we're going to leave the kids back there for this one. Because I think this is important for every adult in here to grasp this. But as the band comes back up, five years ago, I showed the church what it looked like when the church was really on the go. And God said, I want you to do that again. So that they can get a mental picture of what the opportunity is. So they can get a picture of what the opportunity is. We can't be like David and stay home. We can't be like David when we're supposed to be out to war. Do you realize the Bible talks a lot about the armor of God and it talks a lot about the battles that we'll fight? We are at war for lost souls.